Hello everyone, welcome to another lecture for 2090 Online. Today we're going to discuss feminist theory, so another way that people analyze and dissect text. So, feminist criticism is an overarching subset of, the, again, the broader feminist political movement. So, basically, what is feminism? Well, seeks to rectify sexist discrimination, right? Seeks to... Um, have societies become more equal, egalitarian. So the main focus concerns how humans construct sex and gender, fulfill gender roles and sexual roles, and identify what is considered masculine and feminine. So again, as I said earlier, how the queer theory is an offshoot of this. Let's look at this one, especially with the last works we're going to be reading and viewing. So in terms of feminist criticism, right, in terms of whether you are using feminist theory for literature, film, sociology, psychology, things like that, right? So when we talk about sex, right, we're referring to the biological and physiological characteristics, right, that define men and women. Although this aspect is, of course, biologically based, it's still defined by cultural axioms. So one of the kind of important issues is what do we do with genetic spectrums? Because the problem, of course, with just saying sex in biology and physiology is there's a lot of different genetic spectrums. So, for example, hurdler uh, Miria Pantino, right, famous Olympic hurdler. She was stripped of her medals because one day she forgot she was running late. She forgot her birth certificate. They tested her and accused her of taking steroids. She never took steroids, and time and time again, they kept on popping up. So... They basically stripped her of her medals. She, of course, tried to sue and everything like that. And then doctors got involved and they discovered that there's a lot of important genetic aspects. Most common one is called androgenin insensitivity. So there is a presence of a Y chromosome there. Now, of course, physiology, right? She's female. She's able to have kids, right? There's nothing that disrupts the regular physiological kind of characteristics. However, there is a genetic Y chromosome, right? So, of course, people are were trying to do studies, right? Is that why maybe she was more competitive? Is that so? All these things are connected to, of course, what feminist critics are very interested in, right? How do we view gender? How do we view sex and so forth, right? So just to kind of show you how rampant these are, right, that there is a large biological spectrum, one in 300 births contain some sort of genital anomalies that lead to androgenin insensitivity. So when you think about that in population, that's a large amount of population, and there's a lot of research on this. So what feminist critics really research is how we view that idea of physiologically male, physiologically female. Of course, too, gender, right? So the gender roles as well. So the social roles, the behavioral activity-based roles, all the kind of attributes that a given society considers appropriate for men and women. So it is the range of characteristics pertaining to, and of course, differentiating from masculinity and femininity. It could also be an internal sense of self. So gender is, again, um, always had a very broad spectrum, even more so, I think, in today's vocabulary, we recognizing in the Western world, at least, that there is perhaps a spectrum. So it could be the internal sense of self as masculine and feminine, both or neither. When, when you start studying gender, what is very interesting is that many cultures believe that we live in a multi-gendered world. For example, the Navajo, before they were colonized by Europeans, they had this idea of the Nadlahi, which translates in English like one who constantly transforms. So the notion of dual spirits, for example. So what they believed is, so they posited five genders, that we lived in a five gender world. There was male, female, then male with a feminine essence, female with a masculine essence, and then the Nadlahi. So a lot of cultures, and this is just one, a lot of cultures had numerous genders, not just two, as a lot of times the Western world kind of posits. In India, for example, too, in a lot of Asian cultures, there was typically a third sex, sometimes even fourth sexes. So there was a fourth gender, a third gender. Um, in India, it was the hijra. And so it's very interesting that a lot of other cultures throughout the history of the world had numerous genders in place. They had numerous understandings of kind of how the gender spectrum worked. So all this leads into kind of how we posit and think about gender today, right? So 
The major issue, though, is that there are two cultural forces that shape gender constructs. So the first one is patriarchy or the patriarchal system, which is still kind of what the Western world is. Think of, again, marriage, you know, the father giving the daughter away, a woman taking the man's name. You know, think of all our leaders in this country, the majority, whether it's the Supreme Court, Congress, president, right, have been all dominating by men, right, that we don't really see, we see a few, but not as dominating or even equal. So we're still caught up in a kind of patriarchal system. So of course, here is where the male acts as the primary authority figure, central to social organization, where fathers hold authority over women, children, property, and so forth. Matriarchal system, too, will shape how gender is constructed. So that, of course, is when females, especially mothers, have the central roles of political leadership, moral authority, and, of course, control of property. So these two systems create a lot of important dynamics in terms of how gender is perceived. So just to give you an example in terms of gender roles, right? So in matriarchal societies, especially the pre-colonized Philippines matriarchal societies, men were viewed as the overly emotional ones. They were viewed as the ones who cry all the time. They were viewed as weak, right? So think about the, the kind of contrast with patriarchal societies that, of course, posit men as always strong. And so it's very kind of important to look at how Either patriarchy or matriarchy functions. Matriarchy does not mean equality. Patriarchy does not mean equality. What would be equality would be an egalitarian society. Most societies, though, drifted towards either matriarchal or patriarchal societies, typically. So the tribes of Tuberind Islands, for example, Western Malaysia, expect men to work under their mothers and sisters, right? In fact, they're supposed to grow and maintain a garden in honor of their mothers starting an early childhood. Think about that. If someone went up to you and like, oh, you know, I, I'm, I, you know, it's a male in our society doing this, right? Think about how we would feel about this activity, right? Patriarchal societies, of course, expect the opposite, right? So we have, you know, these ideas in many countries where women are supposed to be subservient to men. Think in the Judeo-Christian Muslim religions, God is a man, you know, um, and does not switch sexes, as other deities do throughout other cultures. So the way society is structured will reinforce right, how we view gender and so forth, and if it's going to be patriarchy versus matriarchy. Now, unlike a lot of other theories, right, so, you know, think about close reading, you know, where the text is independent. Think about, you know, queer theory where, you know, what are we trying to do is you know, expose homosexual impulses and so forth. Feminist theory doesn't have a single premise, right? There's numerous concepts, numerous interrelated concerns and subtext. So sometimes it's going to be exposing masculine stereotypes. So um, let's say you're in a literature class and all the works were um, written by men, right? Is that purposeful or is that sexist, right? So there's a key kind of an aspect when we get into that, those kind of dynamics, right? Um, think about uh, ways a uh, work can undermine strictly patriarchal traditions. They, of course, study female creativity. You know, they rectify omissions in male-dominated canons. If you were at a... Um, like if you were in an English class 30 years ago, and especially British literature, American literature, you would almost study maybe one woman, but that's about it. You look at the anthologies that are made today, and it's a very, it's a much more, you know, equal representation. Discovering lost or neglected works by women, that's a very important concept for literature and film. Examining the forces that shape women's lives and so forth. Studying gender roles, of course, and creating new ideas of and roles for women. So again, there's a lot of interconnected, interrelated concepts that feminist critics look at. And especially as we'll get to in film, a lot of important dynamics that fit into these ideas. So when feminist critics kind of use theory to look at literature and film, they look for ways the authors kind of construct masculine and feminist impulses, of course, subtext, within a work, especially in how authors create kind of characterization. So critics focus on the concept of agency and the gaze, right? If you're familiar with philosophy, agency wouldn't be anything new. It originates from Rene Descartes. Agency refers to the capacity of individuals to act independently and to make their own free choices. 
So by contrast, structure includes those factors of influence such as social class, religion, gender, ethnicity, any kind of custom, right, that limits people's mobility, right? Why don't you smoke? It's against my religion. Why don't I drink? It's against my religion. Those are structural aspects, right, that limit your agency. Technically, free will, right, you could, you could drink unless there's a law in your country, but, you know, everything that is related to agency and structure. So what oftentimes film critics look at, especially when they're applying feminist criticism, is how free female characters are to move. Right Now I'm using Jurassic World and this is a perfect shot to show how we reinforce gender roles with film. Notice how, of course, our male lead is the one who's protector mode the children and the woman right behind him, the woman afraid, right? He's trying to be as cool and confident as possible. But again, he's protecting them, right? So that reinforces patriarchal gender roles, right? That the male should be the protector, that the male should be the provider and so forth, right? Notice too, again, it's just, you know, how she's dressed and so forth to accentuate, you know, her body. And then he's closed just to show, you know, the arms and things. And so the time and time again, you'll see that. But that's what we mean by agency, right? You know, as actresses right they typically don't get great roles compared with the numerous roles for men right and the different roles for men so a lot of times feminist critics investigate why that is and why that keeps occurring right the other concept as i said is the gaze or the male gaze right and this comes from 1975's laura uh, mulvey's visual pleasure and narrative cinema she coined these terms it's an analytical concept that deconstructs how an author presents and portrays characters as well as how an audience views characters so Mulvey argues that throughout Western literature, and more specifically in American films, women are typically presented as objects rather than possessors. I used the Jurassic Park as an example, right? She needs to be protected, right? So it you see the overlap with agency and the gaze as well. So many film examples that you see of the sexualization of women, right? You know, <clears throat> he's a slug. You know, why does he want a bikini clad woman, right? Shouldn't he be interested in his own kind? Who is this really for? Well, again, as Mulvey points out, the audience, right? This is not for him, right? Even though she's his slave, right? It's for us, right? As a viewer. Even in feminist movies, they even undercut a lot of times these kind of visuals to show or reinforce how the gaze is working, right, or operating. And so you'll see time and time, time again, right, women sexualized, women objectified, right? Suicide Squad is a perfect example too, right? Notice how all the men are super clothed, right? When we have the women, you know, always showing skin. Even when they're closed, what are we highlighting? Even color scheme wise, visually, what are we highlighting? Of course, the cleavage and so forth. And then we have our um, one villain and who's pretty much naked under her veil. So time and time again, we see Mulvey's, and again, she wrote this in 75, we're now many years later, right? We see even four decades or you know, four and a half decades later, right? We still see this in play. And that's an important concept for feminist criticism. Again, great example of when a female directs a movie versus male, right? So all of a sudden, when a female directs a movie, right? Same characters, the Amazonians, right? They are clad in more warrior type getup, right? Now, when a male is in charge of the directing, right, what do we see, right? Leather and, and so much skin, right? And, of course, cleavage highlighted and all this thing, right? So it's just very interesting, right, in terms of investigating how Mulvey's kind of ideas play into even modern cinema. And again, even in cartoons, right, what do we get? Objectification of women. And so it's just a very kind of important concept and another way to look at film, right? If you're very interested in kind of these concepts and how Hollywood and cinema in general treats women throughout history, it's very interesting to look at these kind of concepts. We even see it too in advertisements and all sorts of things right time and time again we're going to see men as like clothed women as less clothed we're going to see more of the kind of what do we highlight you know with lips and hair and so forth the color scheme too or the bottles even of the perfume right so there's just all sorts of ways that we could apply Mulvey's theory now, another critical, and, and we'll, um, I'll put this video up separately, but the Bechdel test is another important kind of aspect when we're studying film. 
It started as a joke, but it looked at female representation in drama and cinema, and it's a very crucial concept. So after you watch the film, again, we'll have a discussion board on that, but it's a very important video to look at. So overall, again, what do feminist critics consider, right? Well, how is the patriarchy preserved or subverted in the text or in the film, right? What, again, going back to heteronormativity with queer theory, same thing with feminist theory. How are the patriarchies, right, preserved, subverted, and so forth? How are female and male characters described physically and mentally? How do female and male characters behave around the opposite sex and same sex? How do female and male characters behave and think in private? What are the subjects of conversation, right? Male characters focus on with other males, as opposed to the subject matters females discuss with other females. What's the ratio of male characters to female characters? That's a crucial kind of concept, especially for film, right? Once you start looking at the Bechtel test, you'll see more and more that, again, all these kind of ideas, you know, really pan out to modern cinema that, oh, wow, there's a lot of movies that are telling more male stories than female stories. And it's an important aspect to kind of study when you view uh, literature and film. Obviously, if you have questions, email, post them to the Canvas form. If not, just best of luck to you with all the other assignments and take care.